Bueno, gente, voy a seguir con las historias secundarias. Lo que sí van a escuchar a una persona hablar, que no soy yo. Eh, porque voy a escuchar la historia completa, digamos, de del 1, del 0 al 2, por lo menos. Para ponerme al día mientras que hago las misiones secundarias. Así que, eso. Turn Tachibana starts looking for the real murderer. The goal right now is to find the empty lot owner so they can buy it up before the Yakuza do. So Wana shows up, tells Nishiki to sit his punk ass down, basically tells Kiru they didn't know about Kazuma's and Cahoots with Tachibana. They give Kiru till morning to turn in Tachibana or they're throwing them on the Dojima hit list. Morning comes, guess what? Kiru ain't no snitch, my man's Kiru ain't no bitch. At this point, the entire Dojima family is out to kill him. Kiru's on the run and dips into the sewer because no one would look for him there, right? Wrong! Kuze's in there already with a motorcycle ready to run his ass over. A fucking motorcycle. How do you even get a full-size motorcycle into the sewer? And how long was Kuze stinking ass there waiting for him? Like, he probably saw some shit. So even with a motorcycle and a big-ass metal pipe, Kuze mm. still gets his ass whipped. <sighs> like, he didn't learn his lesson the first time. Like, really, though, this man can't fight for shit. Then Kiru runs into Wano. Wano tries to recruit him, but Kiru's all like, I'm not joining your bitch ass. I'd rather get shot. And he gets to step in when Nishiki pulls up. Nishiki's all like, get in the car, fool, before they find and kill you. They stop in the middle of the forest. At this point, Kiru knows Nishiki's on some sus shit because guess what? He is. Man pulls a gun and is about to kill his sworn brother and tries to justify it by saying he doesn't want them to capture Kiru and torture him. There are some fates worse than death. Nah, fam. I ain't buying it. Nishiki, you trip it. Kiru's badass self is all like, shoot me, bitch. You won't. Even tells Nishiki to man the fuck up and stop crying. Let's go, Kiru. I see you. Do your thing. Anyway, gun goes off, Nishiki can't shoot, Nishiki cries some more, Kiryu's all like, I have to do things, we're not sworn brothers anymore, takes the man's car and just dips, like, leaves his mans alone in the forest at night. And remember, this is the 80s, cell phone reception isn't that good during this time, we're not even sure he even has a phone at this point, how the fuck is he gonna get back to Kamurocho? Nishiki, you better get the step in, that's cold blood, Kiryu, respect. Now we're back to Majima. Remember that blind girl he was supposed to kill? Yeah, he couldn't do it. Majima might be a bad, bad man, but he's not a bad guy. She confirms she's Makoto, and she's looking for a man with a bat tattoo, but we won't say why. You go find Lee to find out that she's actually blind because of the dude with that tattoo. This fucking scumbag kidnaps her, keeps her ass in a cage, and then sells her off to the Korean mafia. Where even more bad stuff happens. She now has post-traumatic psychogenic blindness. She wants to find the guy to protect other girls, but that doesn't explain why the Yakuza are after her. Lee proposes ah. using a body double to save Makoto and protect Maji's mother's interests, but he refuses because that's some shady shit that Maji's mother's not willing to do. The next day, though, the girl that was supposed to be the body double is found dead in the river. Majima didn't do it. Lee didn't do it. Who the fuck did it? The phone rings. It's an unknown caller offering a trade to Majima for the hit. Majima meets up with Hitman Nishitani, patriarch of the Kijin clan. And by the way, guys, I'm not Japanese. Don't crucify me on these pronunciations. I apologize. Of the Omi Alliance. In return for doing the fake hit, Nishitani won't pull real Makoto. They fight. Why wouldn't they? Nishitani goes to jail. Majima tries to feed some bullshit to Sagawa about the hit, but Sagawa's not buying it, and his scouts find where Makoto is hiding. They have no choice but to flee Sotomboro in Lee's van. They get in the van and BOOM! That motherfucker is dead! So guy was all like, why are you fucking with me, guy? Now I have to kill you. That's messed up. I thought we were cool. Raises his gun and BAP! So guy would get shot? Wait. What? Who the, who, the, who the fuck is this guy? This is like the fifth person trying to either go after or protect this girl. Why the hell is she so special? Mystery man pistol with Majima. Black screen. Previously in Kiryu's story, some stuff happened. I've been talking a lot, I'm not gonna repeat myself. We'll wind the video. Anyway, Kiryu's back in Kamadocho. Yakuza is still searching everywhere for him, and his house is on fire. Kiryu gets found, fights off a bunch of homies before getting overwhelmed, and right before Kuze gets his revenge, BAM! He gets hit by a fucking car. Tachibana's all like, get in! And they out. Like, out. Bye, Felicia. After the rescue, Tachibana's not doing so hot, so you go to an underground hospital. Him and his assistant, Oda, are ex-Chinese yeah, mafia. Well, and the camera pans down to show you oh, that Tachibana like that. has a bat tattoo on his arm. <laughs> Holy shit! Tachibana recovers enough to enact a plan to get the Yakuza off of Kiru. They're walking okay, straight man. into the lion's den to make a deal with the heads of the Tojo. For those that aren't keeping up, the Tojo are the clan, Dojima is the family in the clan. So they are going even higher than Dojima to get this issue solved. 
Kiru's all like, what the fuck? Are you crazy? I was in the Yakuza. You don't do this shit. But Tachibana's about to make an offer no one can refuse. Straight godfathers the whole shit by dropping 500 million yen in exchange for Kiru's life. That's roughly 5 million US given variable currency exchange rates. And remember, this is the 80s. I know. 5 million then is like 11 mil US today. That's a lot of money for one man's life. Most kidnappers only want a couple hundred thousand, and that's even if the family's rich as fuck. And then Tachibana says he'll drop another 500 million yen once everyone's officially backs the fuck off. That's 1 billion total. And then he says he'll give Tojo 30% of their Kamadocho profit. Over a long period of time, that is a fuck ton of money. When did Kiru start shitting gold? Deal goes through, Kiru no longer be hunted by the Tojo, but let's not forget this is the Akuza we're talking about. Even if you give them mad bread, you have to have a brawl after that shit if you want to get out. My man's Kiru is fired up! Someone just paid a billion yen for his ass. You can tell because he didn't take the stairs. His ass just jumped straight down. And he's about to mess everyone up in this bitch. Guess what? He does. They get out. Tachibana informs Kiru he finally has a lead on the lot owner. Turns out this person is in Sultan Bori. For those of you who are having a hard time keeping track of the uh. spider web of conspiracy, that's also where Majima's story is taking place. Hmm. They also believe Shibusawa and the Omi Alliance are looking for this person. So pack your bags, bitches. Road trip. Or plane. I don't know how far it is. To Sartan Boy! But hold your damn horses. Tachibana has more information. Tachibana says the person who owns the lot is a young woman. Okay. Okay. A sight impaired young woman. Huh? She's functioning blind. Wait, no. You gotta be fucking crazy. The woman's name is Makoto. Holy fucking shit! It's starting to come together. Makoto is being hunted by multiple families in the Yakuza and Tachibana's crew. All for this empty lot in control of Kamarocho's pleasure dish. Some want her to sell, some want her dead. Majima and Lee have to save her. She is the key to this whole fucking shitstorm of conspiracy and treason and punching people. Let's not forget Tachibana has a bat tattoo. Does he want Makoto for the lot? Or some other reason? Let's find out. But not right now, because we're back to Majima. And the weird mystery man in the nice ass suit. In case you forgot, Majima got knocked out. Sagawa got shot, but apparently he's not dead. And this man just walks away with Makoto. Who the fuck is this guy? Majima gets captured and Sagawa beats him to hell for betraying him. I mean, it's the Yakuza. Sagawa mentions the order to kill Makoto came from Shimano, Majima's old boss. But no one knows why. Nishitani might know why, but he's in jail. In order to get to Nishitani, Majima meets up with a detective who wants him to join a fight club. However, some of you might remember rule number one, we don't talk about fight club. The first rule of fight club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. Second rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. Boy. So moving on. You do the thing, get your ass thrown in jail, and finally meet up with Nishitani. If this shit couldn't get any more complicated, White Suit Guy is part of another group, an underground operation called the Nikio Consortium, who report directly to the Tojo. And White Suit Guy, Sera, is the consortium's president. These guys are basically the black ops of the Yakuza. Nobody knows about this shit. Nishitani was hired by Shibusawa, one of the dicks that were going after Kiru. So Majima breaks out of jail after Nishitani gets shot multiple times and hauls ass to the consortium HQ. He finds Sarah, who says the girl's been passed off to a colleague. And for some reason, Sarah wants to keep Makoto safe even though all the other Yakuza want her ass captured or dead. Then we finally learn why this tiny ass plot of land is so damn important. This plot is uh. worth over a billion yen and is the key to the Kamurocho revitalization project. The money and power given to the person who controls this project is said to be immeasurable. Finally, we understand why people are dying and why everyone is going after this chick for this tiny ass plot of land in the middle of this big ass city. So Sarah proves very helpful and BAM! Sakawa bitch ass shoots him. He pulls a business card out of his pocket and it's Kidu's card since he's working for Tachibana now. Wait, what? Sarah's underground Tojo clan but it's helping Kiru, who left the Dojima family and is now working to stop the Yakuza from owning the lot. What the fuck is going on? Well, if you're completely lost at this point, too bad. Back to Kiru. Just before Majima's recent series of events, Kiru arrives in Sotsenbori, picks up Makoto from Sarah, and Makoto learns that the land was owned by her grandfather who passed away. She just wants to get rid of the damn land because everything's going to shit and everything that's been going on, she just wants it to end. Kiru just wants to keep Kazuma safe by helping Tachibana, so they're both like, bet, let's get this deal done, we out. 
So they're on their way to Kamurocho, and who decides to show up but Shibusawa? Man puts a clean bullet through the driver's head, and it's a full-on shootout on the highway. We're way past fists at this point. I mean, there's a fucking helicopter, and a chain gun, and a rocket launcher. Where the fuck do you get a helicopter? So with a pistol, Kiru takes down an armored chopper. Go figure. And they hide out in some random construction site. Ona then loses his shit and pulls a gun on Kiru and says he can't let this girl meet Tachibana. Makoto has to be the baddest blind chick I know because she shanks this motherfucker easy with her cane. Kiru puts him on his ass and then the story gets even more crazy. Turns out Oda has a bat tattoo as well in the same spot on her arm. It's a mark of the gang that Oda and Tachibana were in together. Before meeting Tachibana, Oda was in some shit including human trafficking. Makoto being one of them. Much later, Tachibana and Oda see Makoto on the news. Oda recognizes her immediately from his job before he met Tachibana, whereas Tachibana recognizes her immediately because she is his sister. Time out. Makoto's Tachibana's sister? Oda basically sold his homeless sister to the Korean Mafia before they met. Fucked up, guy. Shibusawa's people find the construction site and raid. Hop Oda full of holes, but luckily, Kiru and Makoto are If you didn't think so already, Oda's a real piece of shit. But apparently, he was on Shibusawa's payroll, handing over tips and information to Shibusawa this whole time. But now he's dead. That's right. Fuck you, Oda. Good riddance. Back at Kamurocho, everyone's intentions is beginning to be revealed. Tachibana knew his sister owned the lot and was working with Kazama to protect her. Kazama wants the lot to control the Tojo from behind the scenes and keep it away from his rival Dojima. As Tachibana and Kiru are planning their next move, BAM! BAM! Kiru gets shot. Someone hired an assassin to catch her Tachibana and Kiru gets shot. Kiru gets patched up and runs into more Dojima family while he's looking for Tachibana. Nishi's with them and is all like, I won't let these bitches mess with Kazama-san. You're not getting that lot full. Let's kick everyone's ass, Kiru. Yeah, Nishiki. High fives. Let's go. They have a quick, you're my brother. I love you. Moment. And then they do the badass rip your shirt off thing and start kicking everybody's ass. Seriously, I, I, need, to, I need to learn that. So Tachibana is getting tortured by Kuze's men. One dipshit goes too far and clocks the guy with a sledgehammer. A fucking sledgehammer. Kiru and Nishiki bust in, kick more ass, and womp womp. They're too late. Man took a sledgehammer to the face. He's gonna die. But before he does, Kiru learns that Dojima is the biggest douchebag of them all. Dojima is the one who hired the assassin, the one that shot Kiru and captured Tachibana. Dojima is the one that is trying to drive Kazama out of the Tojo clan, and that is why Dojima is the one that framed Kiru for murder. That's right, Dojima hired the assassin to kill the dude after Kiru whooped his ass in the empty lot. Basically, Kazama brought Kiru into the family and superiors take Good. responsibility for underlings that huh? have major screw-ups. So by framing Kiru, then Kazama is going to take the fall for that and potentially have ramifications with the family. And that's what Dojima is trying to do. So Tachibana is dead, Kiru is wicked for the off. And Kuze, after getting his ass beat down by Kiru for like the 10th time, says that the Omi are trying to get the lot too. If the Omi get it, then they're going to march right into Tokyo and have an all-out war with the Tokyo. If you couldn't tell already, even within the Yakuza. So the first time Makoto gets to experience her brother in God knows how long, feel for you girl, but Kiru's got you. Don't worry. But more than that, Majima's turn. Majima's in Kamurocho and meets up with Shimano, his old boss. Shimano basically planned the whole thing out knowing Majima would have killed the girl, and she would end up trusting him. Now all Majima has to do is get the girl, get her to sell the land to Shimano, yeah. and Majima's back in the family. No one has to die, all right? Cool. Shimano wants to give it to the Omi, and then he will run the Tojo clan yeah. on the side while the Omi take over Tokyo. So let's catch everyone up, because I know it's a lot. Through various means, Kazama, Dojima, and Shimano are all Yakuza, but they are all trying to get this lot to control the Tojo clan in some way, shape, or form. We've been explaining this whole convoluted story, and that's it. But th that's it. Three people trying to buy land off of one girl, and all of this shit happened. But obviously the game wouldn't be as fun if it was that simple. Anyway, Majima goes searching for Makoto and finds her on a rooftop overlooking the empty lot. Oh shit. Her eyesight's starting to come back. That's crazy. So since he met her brother, I guess whatever emotional trauma that she had is starting to subside and now her eyesight's starting to come back. But what's really crazy is how she arranges the meeting with Dojima <laughs> and will sell him the lot, but she doesn't want money. She wants the heads of his three lieutenants because they're responsible for killing her brother. This chick is fucking ice cold. Respect. 
Majima gets there just in time to BAM! Watch Makoto get shot. And Dojima and his people just did. As long as no one makes a claim to the land, who will yeah. care, right? And Dojima can move forward with this project. Or at least that's what he thinks by killing Makoto. As you would guess, Majima is fucking pissed and annihilates the entire group of thugs at that meeting. Sarah's people show up, get her to a hospital, and thankfully the surgery was successful. The girl would live. Majima's all like, fuck that! If Dojima's around, she's not safe. Uh. And rushes off Hi. to finish what Makoto started. By himself. Against the entire family in their HQ. What's Japanese for Leroy Jenkins? Because Shibusawa delivered Makoto, he is now the new captain. And his first order is to eradicate anyone associated with Kazuma and Tachibana real estate. Like hardcore out for blood purge type shit. Kiru finds out Kazuma's plan all along was to give the girl to Sarah so he would become the chairman and help Kazuma keep Dojima's power in check. At this point, Kazuma just wants balance within Tojo and Yakuza. Kiru's all like, nah fam, I have to go warn my people. And while doing that, runs into Kuze again. Kicks his ass again. Will this guy fucking give up? Like, Kuze, take a hint. Kuze tells Kiru they know the girl's alive, and this was all part of Kiru's plan to learn where the consortium's HQ is. They're going to raid that bitch. They're going to kill everyone. Majima makes Arigato it for the Jima HQ and prepares to kick everyone's ass. Kiru makes it for the consortium's hideout and prepares to kick everyone's ass in the middle of a full-on raid. Naturally, everything hits the fucking fan, and it gets to the point where we're like, how the fuck is Kiru still alive? Not that we weren't saying that already, but still. Kiru punches his way all the way to Shibusawa, who has Makoto with him. Majima punches his way all the way through the Dojima HQ, where he finds a Wano. He kicks a Wano's ass, earns a Wano's respect, so the man decides to take a bullet for him when the assassin shows up. Then he takes like six more bullets because fuck it. Awano's dead now, and Majima gets to fight the best assassin in Asia. Spoiler alert, assassin ain't shit compared to the mad dog of Shimano. Dojima then pulls a gun on Majima because he's a little bitch and can't fight with his fist. And right before he pulls the trigger, BAP! It gets shot out of his hand. Sarah here looking all cool and shit with his cane. But you're gonna have to wait and see what happens because Kiru and Shibusawa are having a very provocative discussion about titles and legacy and shit. And Shibusawa does this cool rip your shirt off thing. It's a really intense boss battle where okay, Kiru's out here kicking ass because he's the dragon of Nojima. Right when he's going to let his anger consume him and finish the job, kill his first person and become a quote unquote true Yakuza that Shibusawa claims. Nishiki swoops in to save his boy's morality. Shibusawa's reign is finally over. Yet again, we switch back to Majima. The real life is boring because he's already these last couple challenges. Game, that's the loser. Majima is hell bent on killing everyone to protect Makoto, but Sarah's trying to talk him out of it for the sake of her conscience. Majima does the cool thing that heroes do when they're conflicted, acting like they don't kill someone, but just end up scaring the shit out of them. He ends up taking the high road. Good for you, Majima. Good for you. Turns out Makoto is awakened, the deal is done. Sarah's all like, fuck you, Dojima. I got the lot. Now what, bitch? What's good? And with all powerful, Dojima family can no longer do whatever they want within the Tojo, and balance has been brought back to the clan. Before Majima leaves, Sarah gives him a gun and says, tell Yabashimano to take responsibility for betraying the Tojo. You really expect this guy to off himself? Is Majima gonna kill him? Majima crashes Shimano meeting with the head of the Omi. Apparently they're working on that deal where Shimano's gonna pass off the Pleasure District to the Omi and then take over the Tojo. But they don't know that shit got fucked up. That's why Majima's gonna kill him. He tells Sarah's message to Shimano and passes off the gun. Shimano points the gun back at Majima. The fuck, dude? Really? Just like that? Then pops the Omi leader in the head, like clean shot, but gets blood over the tatami mats, so I guess it wasn't so clean. Shimano still wants to overthrow the Tojo, but realize he needs to bide his time. We'll probably revisit that in a later game. Hint, hint, wink, wink. So after all of that, <laughs> one month passes, and the chairman of the Tojo named Sarah as the new captain who heads the Kamadocha revitalization project. Kitty wants back into the Dojima family for some fucking reason. Really, dude? You go through all that and went back in? Come on, Kitty. But he's determined to walk his own path and create his own style of Yakuza, so I guess I respect it. Majima finally cuts his hair and loses his shirt like what Yakuza fans generally expect from his crazy ass, and he says goodbye to Sagawa. Makoto is alive and well, she can now see, and has a crazy ass guardian angel looking after her, even though she doesn't actually know who Majima is. And that's it. The first story of an insane series of events called Kiryu Kazuma. Now we pass forward to Kamurocho 1995. Kiryu is now listening to the Dojima family. Kiryu is now listening to the Dojima family.
Everyone knows the Dragon of Ogre. It's a thing. It's a, it's a wasted opportunity. The game immediately opens with a huge what the fuck because one of the first things we see is Kiru with a gun. Standing over the dead. Literally two minutes into this game, there's so many questions. What the fuck happened? Why is he just chilling, not running away? What's so important about this ring? This is you. We then go back to the previous day for some context. Kiryu rolls up his homie Shinji, and our man is still scowling, like homie's eyebrows are probably fixed in this position, going to have mad forehead wrinkles. Shinji's a good dude, and he's a little punk that can't do his own collections. We know Kiryu will never pass up an opportunity to help a friend or beat the shit out of someone, so it's a win-win. He's gonna get a nice collection for the family as well, so if you're a fan of the old office TV show, then one might call it a win-win-win. Shinji kicks in the door like his bitch ass is actually gonna do anything, but we all know Kiryu does the punching and gets the money. On his way to drop off the collection, this other fool wants to try our man's, guess what? He gets his ass beat too. Turns out this is one of Majima's people. Majima's moved up in the world since Yakuza 0. He's captain of the Shimano family and patriarch of his own family. But this dude is still batshit crazy. And after some heated words with Kiru, decides to go all in on devising a bunch of crazy schemes that get Kiru to fight him. I'm talking next tier crazy. Zombies, strippers, hiding in giant cones, typical Majima shit. And again, all of this just to fight Kiru throughout the game. Kiru makes a stop at his favorite bar, Sereno, and he meets up with his man's Nishiki and Reina. While they're talking, Yumi shows up. Wait, is this the Yumi? Off topic, but I need to say it, Yumi got some big ass hands. But oh shit, did the developers give her bear paw so we'd see the ring? So going back even further, it was Yumi's birthday a couple months ago and Kiryu was one that gave her the ring. Yes, the ring that she's wearing on her big ass hands the day before the murder, and yes, the ring that Kiryu was holding at the murder scene. You can clearly see that her and Kiryu have some chemistry. I don't think they're fucking yet, but they're probably in that pre-fuck flirt stage where the girls draw it out until the man's blue balls get some noxiously painful. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You can also see that Reina has a thing for Nishiki, but his dumbass can't even tell. He's too busy being around uh. So back to the day before the murder. Kiryu gives the collection money to his patriarch, mentor, and father figure, Kazuma. Uh, this was the guy who was doing all the scheming from jail in Yakuza 0. Some of you might remember Hi. that. Um, they chat about Sunflower, the orphanage that Kazuma owns, and the same orphanage where Nishiki, Kiryu, and Yumi all grew up. Uh, but Kiryu then gets interrupted mm -hmm. by a phone call from Shinji. Dojima's bitch ass took Yumi and dipped. And guess what? Nishiki's dumbass decided to go after him. Kazuma's all like, stay out of it. Think through this first. Be smart. But Kiryu's all like, nah. They're family. I'm going. And he's out. So naturally, the weather goes from a light drizzle when Kiryu leaves Kazuma's office to a full-on monsoon when he gets to Dojima's office. He also ran, so this is all happening in a matter of minutes, which tells you that you know shit's about to go down. Kiryu shows up at the office completely dry, even though he didn't have an umbrella. And Nishiki killed the patriarch of the Dojima family. Yumi's all kinds of fucked up because she almost got raped and just witnessed a murder, and Nishiki looks like he about to cry again. The natural hero that Kiryu is tells Nishiki to take Yumi and dip. <laughs> he decides to take the fall in order to protect those that are closest to him. That's good looks, Kiryu, especially since your ass is gonna spend 10 years in jail. Silver lining that gives you plenty of time to work on your scalp. Before going to jail though, Kiryu gets interrogated by an investigator named Date who doesn't believe Kiryu's bullshit story. More on him later. But while Kiryu is in jail, Shinji tells Kiryu that he's been expelled from the family. He also explains that Yumi lost her memory and went missing the day after the murder. Nishiki also begins his downward spiral as he learns everyone thinks he's useless. He lost Kiryu, Yumi, and his sister died, and now his sole focus and ambition is moving up the ranks by any means necessary. He basically let the dark side of the force consume him, but he is the patriarch of his own family now. Fast forward 10 years later, and Kiryu finally gets out on parole. Now, think about this for a second. Everything Kiryu's about to do, and he's on parole. Doesn't check in with his parole officer once, by the way. Just violates it in every way possible for the rest of this game. But it, of course, no one All the heads of the Tojo clan meet up, and we learn that the 10 billion yen from the Yakuza safe has been stolen! Kiryu's finally back in Kamurocho. Before leaving jail, he got a letter from Kazuma that told him to go to a specific club so they could speak. However, Kazuma couldn't meet because Chairman Seta, yeah, he's dead. He got murdered. Everything in the Tojo is completely fucked and a turf war is starting to brew. You learn that Nishiki betrayed the Kazuma family and is trying to go independent with backing from the Omi Alliance. Shinji is currently a lieutenant for Nishiki, but he's undercover monitoring the situation with Kazuma. Your next opportunity to meet with Kazuma is during Sarah's funeral the following day. You sneak into the Tojo HQ and finally get a chance to sit down with your old mentor. Uh. He's about to tell you some important shit about Yumi and BAM! Kazuma got sniped. 
Naturally, everyone hears the gunshot and instead of realizing the bullet came from the window, Shimano and his goons automatically blame Kiru for shooting his own patriarch. This, of course, coming right after he gets blamed for shooting the Dojima patriarch. Kiru doesn't help his case by throwing one of Shimano's people through the window that had the bullet hole in it, and after Kazuma tells Kiru to take care of Yumi and the Tin Bill, Kiru's rushing to get the fuck out of the Tojo HQ. Shimano tries to stop him, and the entire clan watches Kiru kick his ass, all the while Nishiki's just chilling watching the whole thing go down. Man's being extra sus right now. Just when Kiru is totally fucked with nowhere to go, da da da, who else but Date, that detective from before, yeah, he rolls up in his busted ass hoopty of a car and saves our man. We learned that Date got demoted and lost his wife and daughter because he was too in Kiru's case and the fact that he never sat right with him. You know, typical detective shit. Now he's investigating Sarah's murder and the missing 10 billion and wants Kiru to help him. Kiru pays Reina a visit and learns she doesn't know anything about Yumi. However, Reina did meet Yumi's long lost sister, oh, Mizuki, oh. five years after Yumi's disappearance and thinks that she now runs a bar called Ares. Reina suggests meeting up with a barkeeper at Bacchus because he would know where Ares is. Kiru heads to Bacchus to find a straight murder scene. The patrons are dead, bartender's dead. How the fuck does Kiru keep ending up in these situations? He hears a noise and there's a scared little girl with a gun. She says everyone was like this when she got here and she's looking for her mom. As they leave the bar, they come across a scared, hungry little puppy. Dago is being beat up by some pricks with tiny dick syndrome and naturally we need to kick all their asses. So Kira not only beams this dude with a fucking rock, but proceeds to kick the entire gig's ass. That's right, don't fuck with Dago. We get a little homie something to eat and add him to the crew. We also learn that Haruka, the little girl, snuck out of the orphanage in order to look for her mom, who is her only family other than her aunt Yumi. Wait, what? Aunt Yumi, the same Yumi we're looking for? That would be a very convenient coincidence. Also a little too convenient is as soon as we get this very interesting information, little girl picks the perfect time to pass out, so now we have to take her back to Sereno. After Haruka comes to, we learn that Aunt Yumi used to deliver letters from Haruka's mother while she was at the Sunflower Orphanage, the same orphanage that Kiri and Yumi are from and Haruka's mother's name is Mizuki. Oh. oh damn so the mother Haruka is looking for is the same person Kiru is looking for in order to find Yumi and Yumi <laughs> apparently is Aunt Yumi. Convenient coincidence indeed. Good news is that Haruka knows where Eris is but she wants to go with Kiru to look for her mother so not only does Kiru dealing with all the Yakuza conspiracy that could very well get him killed he also has to babysit this small child that will probably make shit 10 times more complicated. So they get to Eddie's, find a picture of Mizuki confirming she's the bar owner, and Huruka shows Boy. Kiryu the pendant Yumi gave to her the last time they met. Date calls saying Yumi and Mizuki are the ones who stole the 10 billion. What? The Omi also show up saying that they want the girl. Kiryu's eyebrows say, nah fam, you fighting me first. You already know, Kiryu beats down like 10 Omi and they get away. The next day, Kiru and Date are regrouping at Serena when Shinji calls saying he's on the run with Kazuma. Good news, I guess. That means Kazuma's still alive. So Kiru needs info on this whole situation and the only lead he has is an underground information broker that is said to hide out in a place called Purgatory. Basically, you get in by going through the secret door in a bathroom that leads to a homeless camp. But what's underneath the homeless camp is a full-on high-class love den, casino, and fight club. Money, woman, and cage fighting. What else could a rich Japanese businessman want? You walk into the broker's office, which is easily the nicest office I've ever seen in my life. I mean, come on, the guy has a fucking full story aquarium in his underground office. They call him the florist, not sure why, maybe he likes flowers, but you know he's powerful as fuck. Fun fact, any fat guy who can afford to live his life in a fancy ass robe without his shirt is powerful as fuck. So the florist knows everything and he has a full on network built into Kamenocho. If you watch my Like a Dragon review, he's basically this game's golden jewel. You can't pay for the info, so you have to make a deal yeah. to do what Kiryu does best. Punch people. After winning the fight club tournament for the florist, you're about to get some information, but Date shows up and he's been shot. Haruka's also been kidnapped. Like he didn't even try to protect her. Not a good look for Japanese law enforcement. The florist tells you that the van that took Haruka went to the batting cages. Why the hell would a kidnapper take someone this important to the batting cages? That doesn't uh. make any sense. It might have Majima's crazy asses behind it. Majima gets his crew to kidnap this girl that everyone is after and shoots a cop because he wants to fight Kiru. Majima doesn't even give a fuck about the 10 billion or how this girl is being hunted by the Omi. He just wants to fight Kiru. This fucking guy. So Majima gets his fight, you kick his ass, and even though he has a knife, a bat, 
and 10 homies to help him, it's not that difficult of a fight. But then Majima gets stabbed because he refuses to let anyone kill Kiru but him. Whose mans is this? Come come get your mans. So after all that, you get Haruka and go back to Sereno. Haruka explains that while Kiru was fighting Majima, someone came into the room while she was tied up and freed her. Told her that to take care of the pendant because it's worth 10 billion yen. Is this thing the key to finding the stolen money? The stranger also told Haruka to tell Kiru about the pendant. So after some side stories explaining how the floor is some random Yakuza head and Date are all shit fathers, you are taken to a scene where Date is in the meeting with the police chief. Police chief basically says to drop the case and Date just leaves because he knows the whole thing is sus. Two other detectives come out of the closet once Date leaves, wonder how long they were in there, and describe that Date's friend, who could only be Kiru, as a kidnapper. Someone filed a missing persons report on Huruka. No one knows who, but the order came from the top. This whole thing reeks of collusion and corruption, and naturally no one, including cops, can be trusted at this point. Back at Serena, Date shows Kiru a picture of a dead woman who recently turned up. A dead woman who has the exact same flower tattoo as Mizuki. No. Kiru notices the tattoo signature is the same guy who did his tattoo, so he goes to follow up. Only to find out that it wasn't the guy who did his tattoo, but very likely a copycat artist. Tattoo artist then gets a call, but it's for Kiru. Weird. It's Nishiki. Nishiki? He says he needs to talk to Kiru at Serena tomorrow night. Date and Kiru are wanting to keep Haruka safe and discuss Haruka's all butthurt because Kiru went looking for Mizuki by himself and she's just losing it. Because she's a selfish child who doesn't understand how complex the actual world is, she starts blaming everyone and saying that they're just using her to get this money. Kiru tries to literally slap some sense in this child he just met and is trying hard not to tell her that Mizuki might be dead. He asks her to believe in him even though he just slapped the shit. But instead, she's all like, if you're gonna do whatever the fuck you want, then I guess I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I want too. And then she just dips. Like, that's not gonna cause anybody any more problems. Kiru and Date go through this whole ordeal trying to track her down, and they end back up at Stardust, the club Kiru first went to when he left prison. Bet you never saw this coming. Huduka got her ass kidnapped again. And Kiru has to fight mad dudes to save her again. And right when Kiru's about to get some info, because these dudes are not actually Yakuza, but another organization, BAM! Homie gets shot. Of course he does. So while Haruka is bleeding from a gunshot wound, her and Kiryu make sure to take some time to have a heart-to-heart -heart where Kiryu tells Haruka about her mom. For a little girl who's been shot and her mom is dead, she takes it surprisingly well. Tate decides to follow up on the badge dead homie is wearing and they finally get Haruka to purgatory. Apparently it took a bullet wound to convince her. Date tells Kiru to go have some fun with Haruka since they've been through so much in such a small period of time. So instead of bringing the young girl to an arcade, or a movie, or literally anything else appropriate for a small child, Kiru thought, huh, might be a good idea to bring her to a secret gambling den. The bookie's just like us and is like, dude, you have a fucking kid. And Kiru goes, fuck it, we're on a field trip. And proceeds to let Haruka make the bets because for some fucked up reason, she knows exactly how to play this game without any instruction whatsoever. By the way, don't listen to her. She sucks at this game. However, it's not entirely her fault because the bookie's using rigged dice. Conveniently, the bookie has a whole crew of security waiting in the next room and they blame Kiru for cheating, even though he never touched the dice. So you kick the shit out of everyone while Haruka's just chilling in the corner and then you head back. Great field trip, Kiru. Next time, try mini golf. You finally meet Nishiki for the first time since saving his ass and spending 10 years in prison. He has his hair all slicked back because he thinks he's cool as shit. Probably uses way too much hair gel. And he thinks he has the balls to demand Kiru hand over the girl and the pendant. You learn that Nishiki continued to fuck up as his people are the one that killed Mizuki while they were torturing her. It's fucked up. Nishiki's all like, Give me the pendant. I won't do you wrong. The whole Tojo clan is at war. But our man's Kiru fires back like, fuck your war. This pendant is all Haruka has left of her mom. You ain't getting shit. And then, if it couldn't get any more fucked up, Nishiki admits to shooting Kazuma. BAM! Naturally, Kiru decks the shit out of Nishiki for trying to kill their father figure. And on top of all that, Nishiki shows Kiru the bug he planted on Shinji. Nishiki's all like, I can't trust anyone. I'm going to the top of the Tojo clan no matter what. We're not brothers anymore. Honestly, he probably still mad because Kiryu left his ass in the forest during Yakuza 0. So this fucking guy betrays Kiryu, shoots Kazuma, and is trying to kidnap this little girl and then sends a full hit squad, swords and all, to take out our mans. Kiryu fucks up the crew in the bar, then he gets hyped to fuck up the crew in the alley. You can tell because again, Kiryu refuses to take the stairs. Naturally, just like their boss, Nishi's crew is a bunch of little bitches, and Kiryu slow walks out of there because that's what badasses do. Then there's an explosion at Purgatory? Kiryu rushes in to find that Date got beat down again, 
and the floor still can't find a shirt. I guess I should have mentioned that Haruka also got kidnapped again. Seriously, can no one except Kiru take care of this little girl? This time a gang grabbed the girl, and after throwing some people into boomboxes and crashing a nightclub, Kiru learns the snake flower triad now has the girl. This group is no joke. They're basically Chinese mafia who captured and tortured the shit out of Kiru 12 years prior. Like straight up turned his ass into a living pincushion, voodoo doll level torture. While Kiru's on his way to save Haruka, Shimano is meeting with the Chinese to make a deal for the girl. Then Terada, the Omi head, walks in. Fucking Shimano's conniving bald ass is still trying to deal with the Omi and screw the Tojo. God damn it. Kiru gets to the snake flower try at HQ. Why wouldn't it be a Chinese restaurant? Everything starts cool and Kiru simply says he's there to see the guy that's been torturing him. But all of a sudden, Man pulls out an assault rifle from behind the fucking host station. Homie has to reload because he can't shoot. So naturally, Kiru throws a dead fucking body across the lobby and beams this guy with it. The body is at least 150 pounds, and this man tosses it at least 7, 8 feet in the air. Do you even lift, bro? Naturally, he doesn't take kindly to being shot at, so Kiru Oi. fucking Kung Pao chickens the entire restaurant staff. All of the gang members, and let's not forget, they all have Chinese broadswords and guns. <laughs> but fuck it, Kiru has hands. He fights his way to boss man who has Haruka. Lao Ka Long says that they were really after the girl and no one knows her true value. So you know that even more uh -huh. freaky shit is up. Because he thinks he's cool and he can't just pick up a uh -huh. weapon, he has to kick it and do some cool kung fu twirl thing. But it doesn't matter because again, mm -hmm. Kiru has hands. You whip Lao's ass and save the girl. But the cops don't care because they're stupid and they're always getting in the way. So instead of being all like, GG's Kiru, you saved the girl. Appreciate you. They say, you're under arrest for kidnapping. Answer me this, pseudo. Why the fuck would Kiru beat down the entire snake flower triad just to re-kidnap a girl that got kidnapped from him? Exactly. Your shit doesn't make sense. Date has the same thought, so he tries to give it to Sudo, but Sudo's dumbass is all like, I'm just following orders. Why is it every time someone's just following orders, they're fucking up? Can someone explain that to me? Date is like, fuck it, and lets Kiru out of prison anyway. Not sure why the jail cell has these tiny ass little walking doors, and he tells Kiru that the case is getting deeper than they all think. The badge that Date was investigating apparently it belongs to an underground government organization called the Ministry Intelligence Agency, or MIA. They report directly to the cabinet, which is like a high political office, and they are run by some guy named Jingu. We're basically on CIA level shit at this point. We also find out that the dead body with the flower tattoo wasn't actually Mizuki. Haruka's mother's still out there. Turns out during this conversation, they were getting tailed the entire time. Great detective work, Date. And just like in Yakuza 0, the entire highway turns into a gunfight. With a shitty little snub nosed revolver, Kiru takes out multiple cars, motorcycles, and a full size semi truck. I guess the Snake Flower Triad could afford semis and rocket launchers, but didn't have Shibusawa's budget for helicopters. Shinji informs Kiru that Nishiki is somehow getting insider intel, so they ask the force to help investigate. Turns out Reina, the Serena bar owner, is a fucking snitch. They go to the bar to confront her, but she's not there. She left a letter of confession, apology, and tries to explain how she was willing to do anything to get Nishiki to love her back. Why does love make people seem fucking stupid? Anyway, the letter mentions that she wants to take responsibility for everything and doesn't give any more detail. Conveniently though, Shinji calls immediately after you finish reading the letter and says Reina called Nishiki to Serena and tried to shoot him. Apparently she can't shoot because her and Shinji are currently on the run. Kiyu fights his way through multiple buildings, full of Yakuza, and finally gets to Shinji who's been shot. The general of the Nishikiyama family rolls up and tosses a dead Reina on the floor. No. But you know they fucked up because then Kiryu goes full on Super Saiyan. Kiryu beats the hell out of a dude who spends the entire boss fight dual wielding pistols, but Shinji's not looking so good. He tells Kiryu that Kazuma is with his girl, Akemi, and right before taking his last breath, gives Kiryu back the ring he originally gave to Yugi at the beginning of the game. Shinji's gone, yo. That's damn. The florist gives Kiryu a tip that Akemi could be at Shangri La, the number one soap land in Kamarocho. If you've been paying attention, Shangri-La might sound familiar because, fun fact, that is where Ichi from Like a Dragon was born. So with brothel membership in hand, you decide to take this nine-year-old on another field trip. I guess the gambling den wasn't exciting enough. The host has the same idea we do and is like, you can't have kids here. Kiryu doesn't even say fuck you, he just one-punch mans a fucking marble statue and goes, we good? 
and you thought Kiryu couldn't get any more badass. Do you know how hard a fucking solid marble statue is? You meet with Akemi and learn that Shinji was working with Terada, the head of the Omi, and they are supposed to go to Shibara Wharf. Hold up, the head of the Omi is actually helping Kazuma and Kiryu? Akemi also mentions that not only is Nishiki after the 10 billion yen, but he's also after Sarah's will. This is huge because if Nishiki can destroy or alter that will, he can make himself the head of Tojo. Because why the fuck would we allow Kiryu to have a peaceful conversation? Majima, of all people, drives multiple fucking trucks straight into the Shangri-La front door. Again, all of this just so he could fight Kiryu. Majima gets his fight, he gets his ass kicked again, why doesn't anyone take a hint? Kiryu and Huruka show up at the wharf and Huruka mentions Terada was the man who saved her at the batting cages and told her about the pendant. What? Apparently Kazuma is doing his best Lonely Island impression because he's on a boat and he and Kiryu have a conversation that blows this whole thing wide open. Like nuclear level story bombs start getting dropped everywhere. Terada used to be a hitman like Kazuma and is probing the Tojo as a favor to Kazuma. Bam! Mizuki isn't Yumi's sister. Mizuki is Yumi. BAM! Mizuki has been Yumi's alternate identity for the past five years. BAM! Because all of this, Haruka's mother is actually Yumi. BAM! Jingu, the MIA guy, is actually Haruka's father. BAM! BAM! Yumi lost her memory after Dojima was murdered, and Kazuma took her in to try to help. She saw a picture of Mishiki and flipped the fuck out. This means Kazuma knew who really killed Dojima this whole time. BAM! As far as Jingu is concerned, he and Sarah were always close. Typical dirty politician getting back by with piece of type stuff. That's how he met Yumi. Yumi still had her memory issues and a hole in her heart, but didn't know who she loved before the incident. <laughs> Kiru. <Get him. laughs> she decided to fill that hole, and another hole if you know what I'm saying, with Jingu and Haruka was born. Then Jingu got a proposition to marry the Prime Minister's daughter, which would be a huge first political career, and him and Yumi aren't married yet. Because Yumi's a real one, she decided to step down because she wanted what was best for Jingu. As Jingu's power grew, he went off the fucking deep end and asked Sarah to kill Yumi and Haruka so word of the scandal would never get out. That's seriously fucked up, dude. That's your fucking child and the mother of your child that you once loved. There's going to be a special place in hell for your ass. So Sarah springs a fucking hitman on Yumi, but thankfully Cosmo's there to stop it. And that whole situation is when Yumi's memories come flooding back. Kazama talks some much needed sense into Sarah, and they decide to put Yumi and Haruka into hiding. They put Haruka in Sunflower, Kazama's orphanage, and create the Mizuki identity for Yumi. Oh, by the way, that 10 billion Yumi stole, that was never Tojo money. That was Jingu's money that Tojo had been laundering. BAM! Okay. Just when everything is starting to get really good, Shimano shows up. He's pissed because Terada betrayed him. There's a full-on brawl going on between the Shimano and Kazama families, and they're over here throwing fucking grenades at a boat like they're egging the house. Where'd you get all those grenades? And how the fuck is that boat not sinking? Kiryu's pissed now because yet another peaceful conversation is interrupted, plus the suit's all wet. Don't know how the fuck the fat guy, nine-year-old child, and the guy who can barely walk got off the fucking boat, but I guess it doesn't matter because Kiryu's about to beat the shit out of everyone anyway. After getting straight disrespected by our man's Kiryu, Shimano chucks a grenade at Kazuma and Haruka. Terada shoots Shimano down immediately. Not sure where that was during the massive brawl, Terada. Good looks. And even though this huge explosion hit them point blank, Haruka is completely fine and Kazama somehow still has all of his limbs. But he is pretty fucked up. Kazama then continues to drop even more bombs on the story. The money wasn't just stolen by Yumi. Kazama and Sera did it in order to out Jingu. Bam! Yumi is at Eddie's right now. Bam! Kazama has Sarah's will and gives it to Kiru. Bam! Kazama killed Kiru's parents. What? Kazama killed Kiru's parents. Bam! And Sunflower is actually an orphanage for the children whose parents were killed by Kazama. Bam! 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 Oh shit, there is so much going on right now I can't handle. So even though Kazama killed the parents of Kiru, Nishiki, Yumi, and God knows how many other kids, Kiru doesn't even care because to him, Kazuma is his father. But the man did just eat a grenade, so after that long ass conversation, he finally decides to die. Kiru's father figure, the only man he ever looked up to, is now dead. Big rips. Sudo's dumbass finally wises up and starts working with Date to piece together much of the information Kiryu learned from Kazuma. Kiryu and Haruka finally get to Eddie's. They finally found Yumi, y'all, and all three of them have a very touching reunion, only to get interrupted by the asshole himself, Jingu. This dickhead then takes a gun out and with no hesitation shoots at Haruka. 
Kiryu's that guy and one can take a hint and Jingu's back. Right when he's ready to kill Kiryu, Hanuka decides to play hero. Gun goes off. Oh shit, he did not just shoot her. Oh damn, Yumi took the bullet? What the fuck? Jingu then points the gun back at Kiryu, and this time Nishiki shanks the shit out of Jingu. Nishiki's tight because Jingu played him, and then proceeds to shoot the bomb with him and Jingu in the vault. Boom! Bomb goes off, it looks like the entire floor goes up in smoke, but somehow the money isn't destroyed, it just rains out of the building. Also, the room everyone's in got blown the fuck up, but apparently the blast didn't do anything to Kiryu, Yumi, or Haruka. Shout out to Video Game Logic. Everything is not okay because Yumi still has a bullet in her. Kiryu and Yumi finally confess their love to each other. Kiryu gives the ring back and there's another very touching moment that makes you feel for the whole group. Yumi doesn't make it though, and Haruka just lost her mother. And after all of that, these dumbass cops are still pointing guns at him. Really? Really? At least Kiryu still has the chairman position to look forward to, right? Wrong. Just how his dumbass decided to go back to the Tojo after Yakuza 0, Kiryu's over here trying to get out of the Tojo at the end of this game. Within a matter of minutes, Kiryu was inducted as the chairman of the Tojo clan, but then immediately announced his resignation and retirement from the Yakuza. Kiryu's once again a civilian. He named Terara, the useless ex-Omi head, to be his successor. So there you have it. Everyone who was once close to Kiryu is dead. He gave up on being the head of the Tojo and he has to take care of this girl who isn't even his. My man's really got the short end of the stick for the last 10 years and probably for the next 10 until this girl is finally grown up and can move out. Also, I stopped liking Haruka during the final cutscene because she just decides to up and leave Daga, like in the middle of the city. Lil Homie was loyal to you this entire game after you nursed him back to hell and now you just go and abandon him and she wants to use this bullshit excuse like, oh, I want him to find his mother. Nah, Haruka, that's not cool. Shout out to Dago, Kamenocha in the early 1980s. Everybody's living it up. I mean, it's the 80s. But there's this sketchy looking dude with trench coat that literally no one notices. For real, I'd be all like, yo, that guy's got a gun. We got a bounce. Yeah, he definitely got a gun, but we know nothing else at this point. He works his way through the building and hears gunshots. What the fuck is Kazama doing shooting people? Dying guy tells trench coat dude to get his child who's trapped in the room on fire. He finds the child with his mother and tries to help. She's like, nah fam, and tries to jump out the window. He stops her and she's all like, why don't you let us die? The homie literally slaps sense at her, says don't throw your kid's life away, and right after that she gives the kid up. Black screen. Now it's current day Kamurocho and Kashiwagi got a nice ass office upgrade and is in the Millennium Tower. Even with his nice ass office, he's stressed out because Tarada, the ex only chair, is now Tojo chair. You guys might remember that from the last game. He knows it's about to go down because these two groups do not like each other. Also, Millennium Tower, some real such shit is going down because someone we don't know is talking to someone else we don't know about fireworks and vengeance and Kamurocho and a sea of flames. We learn they have a common goal, but the two people are not necessarily on the same team. Finally, we get to see our man's Kiryu in his badass dragon tattoo. Haruka is a grown up, and Uncle Cass continues to look out for her. It's been a year since the events of the last game, and Kiryu and Haruka make regular trips to the graves of those they lost. Today is one of those days. The nice thing about this game is it gives you optional recap of Yakuza 1 in case you don't remember and completely missed it. But we're not going to talk about that because we already did a full video on it. Really, why are you still watching this if you haven't seen it? Too long video yet? While at the cemetery, Terada shows up to speak with Kiryu. Terada plans to swear an oath with the current Omi chair, Gota, in order to prevent a war. Since the debacle of the last game, the Tojo are in complete shambles and can't handle any more wars right now. Kiryu's all like, I'm a civilian now, and the Yakuza are my past. Then BAM! Terada gets shot by the Omi? Even though they all have guns, Kiryu whips everyone's ass, but it doesn't matter. Terada takes another bullet that looks fatal. Terada asks Kiryu to take a letter to Chairman Gota, and on the way to the hospital, Terada dies. For a small child, Haruka sees a lot of death and destruction. How is she not doing serious therapy right now? But she's also smart and says she'll stay at Sunflower Orphanage until Kiryu does what he needs. Back at Tojo HQ, Kiryu shares the letter with Lady Lujima, acting chairwoman of the clan since Terada died. And if the name sounds familiar, she's the widow of the same Dojima that got killed in the last game. After some heated arguments about war and clan survival, Kiryu's all like, no disrespect, but fuck you, I'm going no matter what. I promise Terada, I still need to atone for Nishiki's fuck ups in the last game, sorry your husband is dead. The captains don't agree with the plan because it's a suicide mission, but for no reason at all, Lady Lojima pulls out a fucking sword and is all like, Kiryu's risking his life for this, anyone who objects, pull up. 
That's a big, big power move. I need to start doing that at work. Just whip out a katana every time someone tries. Before going to see Gota, Kiryu requests to speak with Dojima's son, Daigo. Kiryu believes that he can rebuild the Tojo, but Lady Dojima says he's nothing but a fool now. The traditional way of meeting people in this game then ensues. You find Daigo, Daigo's people are dicks so you kick their asses. You try to talk to Daigo, he doesn't listen, so you beat him until he does. Like I said before, Kiryu believes Daigo can save the Tojo clan and wants him to hold it down in Kamadocho while he goes to speak with Goto. But Daigo said, fuck that, I have a score to settle. Daigo went to jail for five years after making a move on the Omi and blames him for messing up his life when he got got by Ryuji Goto, the patriarch of the Goryeo clan and chairman Goto's son. Basically, Daigo got baited into a fight but was sent to jail instead because the cops were waiting and he was caring. They make it to Kansai, also known as Sokobori, you guys might remember, Yakuza Zero, and they have a night to kill before they meet it. Kiryu decides to stop at the Grand, yes, the same Grand that Majima ran in Yakuza Zero because Kiryu attracts these kinds of situations, there are a bunch of dicks making a ruckus at a nearby table. Their boss is this nasty looking Fable 1 mutton chop having D-bag that's beating the shit out of his own people because they called him the Dragon of Kansai. As always, Kiryu steps in, the homies try him, they get dropped on pianist. Boss Man is super impressed by Kiryu whipping everyone's ass and offers to buy him a drink. Kiryu's all like, fuck your drink, until Boss Man mentions he's with the Goryu clan. Then he introduces himself as Ryuji Goda. Wait, you telling me? Daigo got got by Mutton Chop Man. Kiryu shares his name, but then shit gets really intense. You can tell because Goda's eyes get squinty on the unnecessary close-up. Kiryu denies being the dragon of Dojima though to protect his identity. Somehow Goda falls for that shit. Come on, man. How many Kiryu Kazumas do you know? Then Ryuji proceeds to share all kinds of confidential information with this complete stranger. Dragon of Kansai pisses Ryuji off because Kansai part. He says that there should only be one dragon, and aims to take out the dragon of Dojima with a fireworks show in Kamadocho. He's basically telling the stranger that a war between the Omi and Tojo is about to begin. Weird thoughts, maybe? Back in Kamadocho, BAM! The top floor of the Millennium Tower, Kashiwagi's nice ass office goes up in flames. Everyone sees the news report, including weird old dude from the first scene 20 years ago. Sudo is still with the police, and he thinks there's a foreign group involved with the incident and says Date is the only one who can handle it. Looks like we're getting our old cop buddy back. Back in Sotsubori, we are introduced to Keoru Sayama, a detective with Osaka PD. Uh. We also meet Captain Besho, police chief of Sayama's division. He got a call about Kiryu and they need to put him under protective custody because if Kiryu goes down, the war is definitely happening. After some pleading, Sayama gets the assignment to watch over Kiryu. Kiryu and Daigo meet up at Omi HQ. We find out Kashiwagi is okay, but obviously he's working from home now because his office doesn't exist anymore. In the meeting with the Omi heads, we finally meet Jin Goda, chairman of the Omi Alliance. Takashima, the guy who took Tarada's place, and Sengoku, a creeper troll looking fucker that you quickly learn to hate. Naturally, the meeting starts off heated. Daigo blames the chairman for siding with Tengu in the last game to take over the Tojo. Interestingly enough though, that was an independent act by Ryu Ryuji and his clan, not the Omi as a whole. The hit on Tirada was also orchestrated by Ryuji. Seriously, Chairman Goda needs to get his son on a leash because he is fucking the whole thing up while flying that Omi sigil. Chairman explains the Omi is too large to control and there's a rift between the old heads who make smart decisions and the impatient young brats like Sengoku and Ryuji. Chairman just wants balance between the Omi and the Tojo and is willing to help the Tojo rebuild. Chairman Goda accepts the letter and the offer of an alliance and just as everything seems to be looking up, Ryuji None crashes the meeting to screw it all over. Daigo tries to get his, but then he gets his and Ryuji declares an all-out coup. Because it's Kiryu, he fights his way out, but before leaving, he stops to kick Ryuji's ass real quick to allow Daigo and Chairman Goda time to get away. Ryuji does the bad guy thing like, you haven't seen the last of me, and scampers off like a little bitch. Then with perfect late timing, the cops show up. I guess Osaka PD is just as useless as Tokyo PD. Sayama shows up and puts our mans under arrest, didn't even read his rights. Date is at Tokyo PD to meet up with Sudo, and we find out that the trench coat guy from the first scene is Inspector Kawawa from Foreign Affairs. He's also with the chief of Foreign Affairs, Kurahashi. They suspect a foreign group is involved with the Omi and has a hand in Tarada's murder as well as the Millennium Tower bombing. They've been monitoring chatter including conversations had between Ryuji and the foreign mafia and they need Date to get intel on Kazuki, the Stardust club owner from the last game. Ryuji met with Kazuki not too long ago and Kazuki is Korean. They don't know if the, he's Hi. Korean mafia, but you know cops and their racial profiling. We then see Kiryu with Sayama and the arrest was just a cover to get him off of Omi HQ and Kiryu learns that he is under protective custody. However, it doesn't seem like Sayama can protect shit because Kiryu is the one that actually knows the sniper and even though the bullet holes are perfectly lined up with Kiryu's shoulder, the bullet ends up in Sayama's shoulder. Instead of a hospital or a clinic or any other treatment center, 
Sayama says go to a bar. So Kiryu's dumbass goes to the bar alone and has a full conversation with the lady there. He tells her about the gunshot and she's thinking the exact same thing we are. Why the fuck did you leave her in the car? Kiryu goes back to get her, homegirl gets her shoulder fixed, and while she's resting, Kiryu gets a drink. Guess you don't get that kind of service at a hospital. You learn that bar lady is the one that raised Sayama and once she wakes up, Sayama tells you that the snipers aren't Ryuji's style. Someone else ordered the hit, but didn't want to kill because we also learned that the bullet is smaller than a traditional sniper round. Kiru goes looking for information on the bullet and finds out it's from the Omi's Takashima family. Then we see Takashima talking to the sniper, confirming it was a non-lethal shot and making sure Kiru could trace the bullet back to them. He wants Kiru to know that he can't trust anyone. What the fuck is going on? Whose side is Takashima on? Back to Kiru, the info dealer gets a call mid conversation and said there's a huge bounty on Kiru's head. Because they're stupid and don't know our mans, they try to collect. Spoiler alert, they catch these hands. The info dealer also catches a mug donkeys straight to the middle of his forehead before telling Kiru that Sengoku put the hit on him. Turns out Sengoku and Ryuji are in a race to take out Kiru and because Sengoku can't fight, he's willing to pay mad bread for whoever finishes the hit. Kiryu heads back to the bar where Sayama is and eavesdrops like a sneaky boy before he walks into the bar. Sayama's tight because the bar lady won't tell her about her parents, but Sayama knows they have something to do with the Tojo. Sayama is really on this Kiryu assignment so she can get closer to the Tojo and possibly some information about her parents. Besho calls and tells Kiryu that Daigo and Chairman Goto have been kidnapped. Who would have seen that coming? They were kidnapped by a gang speaking a foreign language and the car had Kamarocho plates. You know what that means. Road trip back to Kamarocho. Before Kiru leaves, Sayama freaks out and is all like, fuck jurisdiction, I'm coming with you. But when they get to Kamarocho, she knocks out. She's running a serious fever after the procedure, so Kiru swoops in like the hero that he is and brings her to not a hospital, not a clinic, or any other treatment center. He brings her to another bar. Seriously? Kiru brings her to Serena, the main bar from the last game. It's been abandoned since the owner got killed a year ago, but somehow the electricity bill is still being paid. Kiru then gets a call from Daigo's kidnapper and says to meet him at the Amano building. Kiru has time to debrief the Tojo heads, and they ask Shindo, the current head of the Nishikiyama family, to help Kiru since that's his territory. Shindo and that entire family are still butthurt about what Kiru did in the last game, and he refuses to help, even though he completely acknowledges the fact that Nishiki was a traitor and brought all that shit on himself. It's clear Nishiki's crew is just as fucking clueless as he is. The Tojo still need help with the impending war. Kiru has an idea, but more on that later. Kiru gets back from Tojo HQ and Sayama's feeling better. I guess the water's still running in the abandoned bar too because she was able to take a shower. You also know she wants it because she just does the whole whoops, my towel fell while putting on different clothes right in front of Kiru. Doesn't duck behind a bar, nothing. Kiru's a good boy though and looks away. Respect. He's not all good boy though and calls her out on the motivation to come to Kamurocho and finds out that 10 years ago, Sayama overheard Bar Lady talking on the phone and said the Tojo made Sayama's life hell. But since then, she refuses to say hey. anything else about the topic. Sayama became a cop to hopefully uncover the truth about her parents. Kiryu makes a stop at Purgatory to get home from Tojo desperately need, but the place is completely different. However, the underground brothel, casino, cage fighting, it's still all there, so rich Japanese men still have something to do. Kiryu returns to the floor's nice-ass office, but the floor yeah. isn't there. The whole operation has been head up by the mad dog himself. Majima went from Yakuza hey. Patriarch to President of Majima Construction and took over the floor's place after he contracted with Tokyo PD to do intel for them. Kiryu pleads for Majima to come back and help the Tojo, but he adamantly refuses unless Kiryu can do the one thing Majima's twisted heart yearns for another fight. But in traditional Flores fashion, it's a cage fight this time. Hi. Because Majima is the one guy in this entire franchise that really cannot take a hint, Kiryu whoops his ass for the hundredth time, and we're only on like the second game. Afterwards, Majima explains how Tirado was not the kind of Yakuza that everyone thought, and basically pushed the old guard out. Majima bailed because he's the real one and didn't want to deal with all the bullshit. As Kiryu is on his way to the mono building, Date and Kawara are scoping out Stardust, the club Kazuki's running. They chat and feed him some fake intel, which spurs Kazuki to dip. That's extra sus. So they chase his ass all the way to the exact same spot Kiryu is sent to meet the kidnapper. What the fuck? There are two Kazukis? The classic, no, I'm the real one, goes down. Kawara's ready to shoot the guy who thinks he's fake, but Date tells him to chill. As soon as Kawara looks away, Imposter Kazuki pulls out dual pistols, bop, 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 shoots Kawara and the real Kazuki. Fake Kazuki is the one that called Kiryu and planned to lure him, the two cops, and the real Kazuki to that spot in order to kill everybody. Date tries to shoot homie, but the ex-cop can't shoot and grazes the man's head. Thankfully, Sayama can shoot, but fake Kazuki's dead and Kiryu can't get any information on Daigo. 
The group dips before the cops arrive, and they actually bring the injured to a real clinic this time instead of a bar. Kazuki's real fucked up, so the doctor starts to work on him. Kido and Date take some time to go back to their old bar to debrief, and we learn that Besho used to work in Kamanocho as Kawara's partner a long time ago. We also learn that Kawara is ruthless and just kills illegal immigrants that resist arrest. Each time it gets cleared up, but this has given him the reputation and the name Killer Kawara. Kiryu then comes back to the clinic to check on Kazuki when two thugs bust in and deck the shit out of the doctor. They're looking for the fake Kazuki, but... He, he dead. On the way out, they deck the shit out of Sayama. Kiru doesn't take too kindly that, so he proceeds to beat the shit out of both of them. Kawa then puts uh. a gun to the guy's head. We learn they are Korean and from the Jing Wong Mafia. This is a foreign group working with the Omi and the ones that kidnapped Daigo and Goda. Back at Serena, Date finds out so he's wanted for murder for the shooting at the Amano building. Surveillance cameras picked up the firing his gun, but the camera angle's super sus, so I don't know about that one. Sudo's also thinking that's a little sus, but naturally the higher-ups don't give a fuck because they're just trying to avoid a media shitstorm. Not to mention they found his bullet from that terrible shot he took during the incident. Great cop work. Good job, Tokyo PD. Kiryu only knows one person who can track down Daiko and gives his old friend the florist a visit. Florist got an upgrade and now works out of Millennium Tower. Room's got a lot more TVs, but I like his old office better because it's got the big ass fish tank and the elevator. I'm also a bigger fan of his old outfit. You know he lost some power when he had to trade in the power robe for the police. Huh? The florist explains that the video incriminating Date was submitted behind his back, meaning homies got a bug. Uh. They finally get a location on Daigo, but now the system is getting hacked. The florist people can't keep up, so Sam is all like, get out my way, peasant, and then takes the hacker on herself, since she is actually a top-tier white hat hacker. Even though no one else notices, we can see that the rat is the same guy that was talking to Ryuji on the phone about the Millennium Tower bombing. This guy's Jing Wong Mafia. We finally learn that Daigo is at Shangri-La, the same brothel that Majima ran trucks into in the last game. You beat up a bunch of Omi and finally save Daigo. GG's. Unfortunately, Goda is somewhere else. We take Daigo back to Serena, Kashiwagi comes through and learns that Jing Wong are behind all of this and tell everyone the history between that group and the Tojo. Over 20 years ago, when Dojima was running the family, the Jing Wong Mafia was their biggest threat. Dojima ordered Kazuma and Shimano to hit the base and kill everyone, justifying it as it's either them now or us later. Kazuma wasn't too keen on the idea, as he didn't want a war, but went along with it anyway because it was an order from the top. This explains why the Jing Wong are so hell-bent on killing the Tojo, and even though they were thought to be completely wiped out, the recent uprising suggests that there are a couple survivors from that night 20 years ago. Terada's funeral was the next day, and these Goryu assholes decide to crash it. Even for organized crime, that's low. The Tojo act like they're helping, but we all know Kiru gets it done by himself and pushes back the Goryu, and then Ryuji shows up. He claims that his boys acted against his orders, and he's actually there to pay respects. They all know he's sus, they tell him to fuck off, but before he does we learn a couple of things. Ryuji has Chairman Goto. The two are not related by blood, Ryuji is giving the Tojo three days until he invades Kamurocho, and Sengoku is also looking to take over Kamurocho. But Sengoku is starting his invasion right now. And who's there to stop his crew? Majima, all by his crazy ass self. Bueno gente, yo lo dejo hasta acá, ya saben, suscríbanse si quieren que te digo pasar al canal Zorro, si no hablé nada, pero es que estoy escuchando la historia y es bien compleja la verdad, así que nada, ya lo veo el siguiente,